We're going to get started now. So today's topic is Xeriscape Gardening, and we have not just one, not two, but three speakers today. Um, Kevin Gibbs is the horticulture agent in Nueces County. Michael Potter is the horticulture agent in uh, Montgomery County, formerly in Nueces County. And our third speaker is Joanne Salge. Uh, she's a lifelong gardener and she is a Nueces County master gardener. She's also a member of the Corpus Christi Xeriscape Steering Committee. And for her day job, she's a coordinator of the Corpus Christi Nueces County Local Emergency Planning Committee providing emergency response planning for hazardous chemicals and materials. So we welcome all of our speakers and I want to remind people that you will be able to get a recording of this presentation and you'll also receive an evaluation form by email and we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out and provide us some input on how we can improve our programs as well as other topics that you might be interested in. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kevin Gibbs. Thank you, Ginger. I appreciate you so much. You always do such a great job. All right, so this morning we're going to be talking about Xeriscape gardening, and I'm very fortunate that I've got some really great folks that are helping me this morning. Uh, Michael Potter, I all I always ask him to do things and I always expect him to tell me no, I, I can't help you, but he always graciously uh, tells me yes, I, I can do that. So I appreciate that. And then Joanne Salgi, I've been working with Joanne ever since I've been in Corpus Christi and uh, she does a terrific job uh, steering the, the Xeriscape committee and, and doing all of that and uh, uh, setting up all the work days and everything there. And she's very knowledgeable uh, about Xeriscape principles. So I reached out to her and asked her to help today as well and so um, we'll be bouncing it around uh, please just be patient with us as we um, kind of uh, hand the baton off to each other back and forth so um, we thank you for coming this morning and we know that uh, that you have uh, lots of things to do and that that your lives are hectic and busy just like ours but we appreciate you tuning into gardening on the gulf coast so we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation i believe we're going to start with joe Ann. Good morning. Um, I'm happy to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, Xeriscape. So the title of our presentation is There is No O in Xeriscape. And um, so we'll, we'll address that as we go along. So a good place to start is to assess what I already have. Um, whenever you're thinking of, you know, adding a xeriscape into your your landscape and your garden, so we're going to think talk about who uses the space, um, what you know, future uses and future uh, things you're going to want to do in that space. Um, what do I want it to ultimately look like, and what do I like about the area that I have, and what don't I like, and also when can I get started? How much time can I dedicate to my lawn and landscape? We all have very, very busy lives. And so um, sometimes we have time for uh, adding to our landscape and sometimes we don't. And so am I gonna be able to handle it on my own or am I gonna you know, tend to neglect it? Also, you need to talk, uh, think to yourself, where do you want to place trees, beds, pathways? You know, where do you want to put things? Um, and it's always good to have that plan in your mind and keep going back to it so that you do uh, move forward successfully. And I think that one of the next things you need to think about is how. How can I do this? Um, do I need help from for my project? You know, if, if it's just you that's going to be out there doing it, how much time do you really have to dedicate to this project? And, um, you know, or is this something that you need to call in contractors? Um, depending on the size and scale of the project, you may need some help. So your landscape is an investment in your comfort and value of your house or in your property. 
Um, Xeriscape can add to that value of your property, especially here along the Gulf Coast and in Texas where we have, uh, where we tend to have uh, very high temperatures in the summertime. And knowing too that one in every four years, we're going to likely be in a drought cycle, you know, as we are now. And here in Corpus Christi, we're currently under uh, phase one restrictions. Um, and I think our, uh, our lake levels are about 30, combined lake levels are about 36%. And uh, so, you know, we are looking at the possibility of going into uh, more restrictive um, watering schedules than what we have currently uh, if we don't see some significant rainfall in the near future. Xeriscape can reduce your water and maintenance costs by about 60%. And using Xeriscape principles, you know, can extend your community's water supply. Um, uh, in the uh, one of the previous droughts around 2011-2012, uh, from um, December to August, by uh, having restrictions in place and really working very hard with the community to realize that they didn't have to water as much as what they previously had been, we were able to reduce the residential consumption by about 14%, which is you know, really significant. So I think a lot of folks have kept those things in mind and you know learned from those previous experiences and then other folks that maybe are first time homeowners or first time gardeners you know may not be aware of how vital you know water is in this area xeriscape is not a landscape style it's a concept of water conservation and xeriscape can be applied to any type of garden you may have a uh, a garden that, that resembles an English cottage, or you may, you know, be very extreme to a Southwest, or maybe it's just a com combination of all of the things that you like. So um, the Xeriscape principles are just good horticultural practices. You know, they're not anything that is just, um, you know, solely dependent uh, where Xeriscape is concerned. And then finally, um, there is no O in Xeriscape. Most of us have heard folks referring to Xeriscape, um, saying it's zero plants, zero water, zero maintenance. Um, any, all of us that are gardeners know that there's always maintenance, there's always going to be some uh, water involved. And um, so there, uh, always keep in mind, there is no O in Xeriscape. So when you're thinking about planning and designing your Xeriscape garden, there's a few things that you need to keep in mind. Um, one of the things would be simplicity. Choosing plants that have a logical relationship to each other, something that's going to complement each other, not something that's going to compete with each other. So whenever you're, uh, you're picking out those plants, you know, look at the relationships of, of height and scale. Um, some folks are going to fit the surroundings and some are not going to be in proportion. So depending on your individual space, that plant that you've just fallen in love with maybe isn't going to work. So you might have to uh, either scale up or scale back. Another thing that's really important to think about is that our gardens, you know, are pleasing to us, but they're also, uh, they add to the value of your property and certainly that curb appeal. So having focal points um, there by using size, color, and texture, they can all be used for accent, or accent points of, of focus uh, to your landscape. You want something that's going to draw you in, but not going to look too chaotic or trashy. I think sometimes, um, well, myself, I, I want every plant. I want it all. I love it all. And so I really have to kind of talk to myself and tell myself that this doesn't fit here. Or, you know, I like to add rocks and I like to add other, you know, other features to it. So we have to really, uh, I guess, talk to ourselves about where that balance is between looking, you know, wonderful and looking like, um, you know, we've just added everything that we can think of, you know, 
to the mix. Also, uh, the one third rule, adding your turf, your beds and your permeable landscape. So all of those things need to be considered. This is an example um, of simplicity. The plants aren't competing with each other. You've got different plants and different blooms, but they're similar heights and somewhat similar textures. And this is an application that would be great along a fence or along the in front of a house where you've got, you know, you've got color, you've got uh, some really good interest and nothing is really fighting with itself. On the next slide, it's still very simple. There's very few, um, there's not a lot of, of plants competing with each other, but some of them are of larger scale, but they all fit together. You know, they're all a little uh, less structured and less manicured. You know, they're full um, and they, you know, they work. And so again, you've got different heights, different textures and different blooms. The, the grasses are going to um, add a, a certainly uh, airy, wispy feel to it, and your salvias are going to add some a pop of color to it. On the next slide, this is a huge space. It's a huge house. It's a huge yard. Uh, you've got huge trees, so everything about it is, is large or grand in scale. And so there's the plants that are here, they're not small. You know, they all have their own space. They all have their own personalities. And so they fit in this space because it is a larger space. And so whenever you have something like that, you know, your trees become part of the, the certainly part of, of the backdrop. And then you have it in a more of a layered approach and uh, everything is to scale. The next slides are looking at, you've still got a very large uh, home on the left and the plants that are um, uh, flanking it are all individually spaced, but they're all larger in scale. And so again, they fit, they fit the size of, of the property and they fit in relationship to the trees and the houses. On your left, or I'm sorry, on your right, you have an entryway that is, um, you know, just an absolutely gorgeous entryway, but the plants that you've added there, they're an accent. You know, they're kind of like, uh, you know, putting the earrings or the, or the necklace on. You've got the great pavers, you've got a beautiful entrance, you've got the backdrop of your trees, and then those smaller plants that are flanking that are just adding extra interest and extra color. Focal points are really uh, uh, good in your in your landscape. Um, here, the agaves are the variegated agaves are are really what your eye is drawn to. Everything has been properly spaced. Uh, they're all like and kind as far as they're all going to be low water. They've been mulched. Um, you've got some larger structural type, you know, palms in the background but it's pulling you in. It's making you look further into the garden and seeing what all's there and wanting to see what the next thing is. So that's very well done. Again, here's another application where you have very minimal amount of plants, but you've got some really great architecture. You've got walls and uh, planters that have been built that are you know, of stone and metal, and you have very few plants, but it really gives you a very dramatic effect, you know, combining um, artisanal type features along with those plants. And so, and certainly very minimum amount of, of, uh, of maintenance would be involved in this. Whenever you're uh, thinking about your, your landscape, um, certainly you wanna create a plan. And in that plan, you're going to need to address all of the opportunities and all of the problems or challenges that you have to do. And most of the time, we're not going to do our garden all in one, uh, one fell swoop. We're probably going to break it down into pieces and, and phases. You know, maybe we'll be working on the front yard and then we'll move to the side yards or to the back. And so 
um, very rarely can we just knock it all out in a weekend. That's, um, that's, you know, unless we have a lot of help, that's not something that we usually do. So whenever you're thinking of your plan, make sure that you're including all of your buildings, play areas, existing vegetation, slopes, drainage issues. Where do I have sun? Where do I have shade? You know, what are the views? What are what are the views that I want to see when I look out my window? What are the views that a passerby is going to see whenever they pass my home and, you know, are looking at my landscape? Also, you want to keep in mind um, how much time I want to spend on maintenance. Again, like I said earlier, most of us have very busy schedules and, you know, we we rely on our gardening as kind of a of an escape from, um, you know, all of the other things that we have to do. And, you know, if that's what um, you enjoy doing is going out and pulling weeds and, and and spending a little time here and a little there, that's great. Um, if you have very, very little time, you certainly want to look at options that are going to be easier and simpler for you. Also, always consider who's using the space. Do you have pets? Do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? You know, are your uh, children budding soccer stars? Uh, do you want a pool maybe later on? If you want a pool later on, um, you probably won't want to plant trees in that space. So be thinking about not just where you are now, but where you might be in a year or two or five years or 10 years down the line. Whenever you're making your, your plan for uh, your property, you might also wanna consider rainwater harvesting or redirecting runoff. Again, you wanna keep as much of that precious rainfall that you can. And so by collecting it and uh, saving it for when you want it, or instead of the water just running down your driveway and going into the, uh, to the city storm drains, maybe you can direct it onto your property so that it will, um, you know, it'll water uh, an area and you'll get to keep all of that water from your, for yourself. Also, it's always a good idea to uh, go to your local landscape experts. You certainly can talk to your, um, you know, your extension agents. They're a wealth of knowledge. But going to your local nurseries, these folks are going to have plants and suggestions and ideas that are going to be based on where you live, not necessarily um, plants that were, that were purchased for a broad area. This was the plan, the original plan for the Xeriscape Learning Center and Design Garden that was designed by Doug Wade. The garden um, started taking shape in the early, uh, night, well, about 1992. And so, um, whereas the, the garden had good bones, it had good structures, it had a good plan. And so, as the garden has matured, We've had to make a lot of changes over time. You know, some of the trees that were originally planted, um, you know, they matured and then they um, declined and so had to be removed. And so we've had to put other things in there and certainly other factors that we had no control over or that weren't really planned, such as hurricanes and uh, freezes and droughts, that's all impacted um, what our original plan was. Another challenge that you might encounter would be slope. Um, so what can you put there? Uh, in this case, there's a retaining wall and they've added some juniper to help keep the soils in place. Um, above, it uh, looks like a cedar, uh, uh, a seed, or I'm sorry, a cypress tree. And so all of these things um, minimize the amount of work that you have to do as far as constant mowing or, you know, runoff or uh, erosion. So that's helping um, uh, handle that challenge. Drainage problems can occur. We always have little spots where water tends to collect. And so take advantage of that and, you know, put in some things that are very thirsty, uh, add some rocks, 
But one of the things that you want to do is to make sure that if you're creating a rain garden, that you don't have water standing that would create issues with vectors and um, mosquitoes and that sort of thing. So uh, that water can certainly add uh, uh, you know, be available to the birds and other, you know, animals, but you don't want to have a, a constant standing water problem. So find ways to uh, work on the drainage um, and uh, find plants that are going to use that water well. If you have limited water sources, you might want to consider the rainwater harvesting and creating that rain garden. Here was an opportunity for um, uh, at this particular property where they could add a, 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 a stock trough to uh, collect water. And then also they're utilizing the slope of the of the property, you know, to run the water instead of down the driveway, but into a, a rain garden that they've created with plants that are going to really enjoy all of that extra water. This is a beautiful um, application, but if you have pets and children, it's probably not one that's going to do well for you. Um, you always want to consider whenever you're putting in um, cactus or succulents, you know, do you have a dog? Do you have cats? Do you have children that are going to be playing in that area? Uh, you know, is this an area that uh, is close to a sidewalk? You know, whenever folks are passing by, you certainly don't want to have your plants uh, reaching out and uh, touching them. Uh, Kevin is going to talk a little bit more about soil preparation a little further in, in the program, but uh, certainly good soil is the basis for all successful gardens. And so here in Corpus Christi, you are going to have to do some uh, 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 modification, you know, to have um, a, a good uh, basis to grow all of, all of our plants in. The appropriate plant selection is so important. We want to make sure that we are choosing plants that are either native or adaptive to our climate and soils. So it's very important that whenever you're at the nursery and you see this gorgeous plant and you want to buy 13 of them, you need to read that label and consider the mature size of the plant. You don't want to overcrowd plants. It's certainly not going to add to the health of the plant by, by being cramped in and not getting airflow. And um, you also want to um, make sure that, that it's, that plant is going to be appropriate for where you're using it. I've seen people buy tiny little um, esperanzas and they'll buy 13 of them and they'll pack them into an area and then before the summer's over, you know, that tiny little Esperanza is now five and a half feet tall. So it really is very important that we think about the width and the height and um, so that plants aren't competing against each other. Again, we're going to choose those different heights, uh, colors and structures. Think about your landscape and what it's going to look like in all seasons. Along uh, the Texas Gulf Coast, we don't really have the defined seasons that you would further north, but we do have seasons. We kind of have hot and we have hotter. So whenever we're looking at these plants, don't just look at what it's going to look like whenever it's in full bloom. It may be in the summertime or in the springtime. Think about what it's going to look like in the winter whenever maybe uh, it may lose its leaves. So at that time, maybe the, the texture of the bark is what you're going to see. Like with a crepe myrtle, you're going to see some, you know, really pretty uh, colors and textures with the bark. Or, you know, maybe whenever... Um, you know, maybe when things are dormant, you know, that's adding uh, some, some character and features too. So think about your whole year, not just, you know, either the spring or a fall growing season. Also, you want to think about where your sunny and shady areas are during different times of the day. Certainly, um, if it's going to get, you know, full, if it wants full sun all day long, you're going to avoid planting it around trees. And um, otherwise, you're going to have to look at morning sun and afternoon sun and how best that plant is going to be suited to that um, to that uh, to that situation. This is an example of what 
full sun. And again, it may be something that works for you. It's certainly got lots of texture. It's got lots of color. It's got height. It's got everything that we could uh, imagine that would work well here in a drought prone area. But again, it may be a little severe for a lot of, of lawns and landscapes. The, you wanna put your plants in, uh, group them by what their needs are um, by hydrozoning or having microclimates. Your primary zone is usually going to be your turf that gets the most use. And that also gets the most water because certainly turf is your thirstiest plant. Your secondary zone is going to be the one that is um, where your beds are. And so this is going to be where most of your visual appeal is. And also it's going to use small to moderate amounts of water. And then there's the minimal zone. That's the area that, that on your property that we rarely utilize. Um, I have uh, an area that's off of my um, um, dining room. It's on the side of the house. There's fences. Um, I have pavers, but I have some pots and I have a couple of things that are in the ground there. And that's my forgotten area. I you know, I have to remind myself to go back there and water it and maintain it. So you're going to have uh, areas that are going to be very high visible, high visible, high visibility, and also high needs. If if you have a plant that's very very thirsty, you're certainly going to want to put it close to your hose bib or to your water sources. Shade gardening is priceless in South Texas. Um, you know, if, if you can, it's a great way to skip the irrigation and just hand water as needed. Um, there are also, um, the shade areas are also the good places for outdoor living. This is usually where we have our barbecue pits and our chairs and, and tables where we can sit down and, and you know, enjoy uh, peace and quiet and read a book and, and you know, have something wonderful to drink. And so uh, shade gardening can be really uh, the area that you spend your time in with your family. Again, it's so important to put the right plant in the right place. This was a picture from our Xeriscape garden a few years ago, and we had beautiful blue agaves. And as they grew, they kept encroaching more and more upon the walkways. And so um, at the end of each one of these is a, a, a very sturdy black barb. And so as people were passing by, there was a, a, a very strong likelihood that, that someone could get scratched or poked. And so we would have to prune those back or else we would have to snip off those barbs. When we do that, it kind of uh, scarred the plant and made it quite not so attractive. So we actually had this in the wrong place. It needed to be more in a center of an area so that it wasn't going to have a, a close relationship with any passerby. Right now, um, with after the freeze, we've lost a lot of, of our uh, vegetation in the Xeriscape garden. So this is gonna be a good opportunity for us to look at what we can do differently, how we can plan, and how we can make sure that it, it's, it's not only attractive and educational, but it's also friendly to anyone that's, that's utilizing the garden. Xeriscape offers you lots of choices. Again, you can certainly rely on native plants, but there's so many that are adaptive to our area. So it's always a good idea to try something. Uh, it may work out very well for you. Um, you may find that it doesn't work out at all, but there's um, look at your plant labels, do a little bit of research, and you'll find that, that we do have a, a wide variety of plants that will do well in our area. So keep in mind, Xeriscape is not just rocks and cactus. You can have all sorts of textures, heights, uh, colors, and uh, have fun doing it, and uh, then be able to stand back and look at it and admire it. Kevin, I think you're up next.
Thank you, Joanne. And I want to remind participants that if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box. Michael, if you're the speaker, we are not hearing you. It, no, it's supposed to be me, but I lost the PowerPoint. I'm going to have to. Uh, it, everything went completely off my screen, so. Oh, how exciting. I know. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I can get it back, OK? Sure. Uh, are you still seeing it? No. OK. What about now? Yes. OK, so uh, I'm actually uh, going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, actually, I'm going to let Michael talk about this. Michael, would you like to talk about turf grasses? Kevin, we're also seeing um, it doesn't look like it's in slideshow mode. We're seeing the slides on the side also. Probably, but well, no. There. OK, it came back on the screen. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're back to slide one. All right. Oh, you're back to slide one? So yeah. Very, yeah, the very first slide. <clears throat> OK. Uh, let me escape again. There's no escaping technology. That's for sure. <laughs> OK. Stop. And we'll present again. I got to get down to turf grass. <laughs> Joanne, that was a very interesting presentation. Now is it there? Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. OK. All right. You know, when it comes to practical turf areas, you know, one of the, the, the components of Xeriscape is to limit your turf areas. Uh, you know, that way you don't waste a lot of water, I guess, you know, on those types of things. Um, what we noticed, you know, even being down there in Corpus, uh, what we noticed was some of the Xeriscape Corpus Christi areas is um, we had some turf grass there. We noticed that the, we could reduce a lot of the water um, just over time by, you know, having a good root system. Uh, rather than applying the one inch of water per week, we had, you know, we were applying maybe even half an inch uh, in some cases, you know, just depending on shade and and depending on the location of the turf grass. But, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, varieties of turf grass that are out there uh, down in the Corpus Christi area. Floratam is a great selection just because it has a, a much larger uh, a root system. Um, you know, the, the whole thing is too, you know, the difference between up here in, you know, Montgomery County, the difference between Corpus is, is a lot of the uh, slopes and things you might deal with or the types of soil even. So you have to be very, cognizant of that um, you know there's Bermuda there's a St. Augustine there's zoysia grass, grasses um, you know there's I've seen zoysia grasses down in the Corpus Christi area and, and others uh, the whole thing you have to remember is that you know most of these grasses will start to go dormant either you know during the winter time or uh, sometimes in the summertime when uh, drought starts to occur. Uh, centipede grass would be one of those, for instance, as it gets real dry, they, they go dormant and zoysia as well. Uh, we have some here at our office in Montgomery County that does that every year. Um, you know, I always tell people if you want green uh, for the longest, it's probably going to be with St. Augustine, uh, but you're going to have to water it. You know, there's a lot of differences, you know, different types of Bermuda grasses. You've got your um, uh, probably one that that's recommended both uh, up there and uh, up down in Corpus area as well as up here is Celebration. I've got a plot here at my office that absolutely does fabulous, but you know it's one of those grasses you have to have it out in full sun. Uh, it's got uh, varying uses. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. And then you know if you have much larger acreage and things like that, you may want to stick with something like just common Bermuda. Um, but very drought resistant uh, and, and semi inexpensive. Um, you know, some of the things, you know, as far as disadvantages, you know, with Bermuda, if you have a lot of shade, you're going to have issues. Um, the fact is it does go dormant easily, 
both you know when it's under a drought situation where it's high stress or uh, even in the winter so um, it's one of those grasses too that uses a little bit more nitrogen uh, than than some of the other grasses uh, just because it you know it's it's predominantly in the heat of the sun and it just needs it um, you know and the other thing is too some people uh, don't like it from the standpoint that it, it invades uh, landscapes and things like of that nature um, but you know for the most high you know deal for the most part you know Bermudas are quite good um, anywhere from one to about two inches uh, just depending on the type of variety uh, anywhere from one and a half you know to one one pound to one and a half of uh, uh, fertilizer it needs to be uh, applied to those areas up to as much as eight pounds just depending uh, on the situation so it, it is a little bit more uh, I guess you know fertilizer it has a little bit bigger fertilizer requirement than some of the other turf grasses and you know basically needs about an inch a week but then again since it is a drought tolerant species um, it does uh, actually require less at some point especially when it's established occasionally you know you'll get situations where they have to be dethatched or or you know you may need to do some aeration or something like that but it, it does take a while for them to establish fully especially if you're going to be seeding those types of varieties go ahead St. Augustine, um, you know, I'm a, I'm one of those guys that I've always had St. Augustine. I've had my Bermuda patches and things like that, and and I've 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 learned to 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 make sure that I have a good quality soil, a good seed bed, so to speak. That way, those root systems get down deep. Uh, I've lived in Corpus, had uh, Floritam St. Augustine, and loved the fact that I didn't have to water near as much as everybody else around me did. Uh, it has some good advantages of being salt tolerant, especially if you live down by the coast. Uh, it is one of the most shade tolerant turf grasses, warm season turf grasses that we have up and down the coast. Um, and, and for the most part, you know, it's a sodded variety, uh, unlike, you know, Bermuda, where you could either do sod or you can do seed, especially with the common varieties. You, you really can't, you can't find any St. Augustine seed. Um, it, and it adapts to a wider, you know, wide array of soils. Uh, and you can see it down in the sand and you can see it uh, as well as uh, up in the very heavy clay soils and it's not as invasive in fact it, once it you know invades a uh, or tries to invade a uh, landscape you can really just pick a runner and pull on it and you'll tug it out so not a big deal go ahead um you know a couple of the disadvantages uh you know for the most part you know it does have especially some of the other varieties that don't have big root systems a little bit less drought tolerance um, but for the most part you know like i said it really depends on the soil and the establishment of it, um, it it's not quite as durable uh, when you have heavy compaction and things like that where you have maybe dogs that are running constantly or heavy mowers and things you can experience some uh, some compaction issues um, St. Augustine decline, you know, with some of those older varieties or even the common varieties, they eventually get that. Um, and chinch bugs, of course, all the St. Augustine varieties are pretty much get that if it, once we get uh, some type of stress or heat issues during the summertime. And it has problems with fungal diseases. And, you know, so do some of the other ones, but um, uh, and not, you know, St. Augustine tends to be a little bit more because it's wide broad leaves and it can, tends to trap a little bit more moisture. Good. Uh, maintenance wise, you know, three to four inches. I, I always talk when I whenever I talk about turf grasses, I like to kind of tell people the way I do my stuff because I, I do it to alleviate some of the uh, fungal issues. I start off, you know, in the early in the spring or even late uh, winter. I start mowing um, quite low. I mean, not to the point of scalping, but to the point where I'm going to start that grass off at a reasonable height, just because cooler temperatures and moistures typically invade, uh, you know, somewhere in that March time frame, and we could still be have lingering issues with maybe a uh, large patch or, or what they call brown patch or large patch. Um, and so I like airflow to really be there, but then I start ramping up that mowing. So I get to the heat of the summer where it's at that three or four inches. Um, some of those varieties, you know, don't like to be mowed that that tall, uh, but as high as you can get it during the summer, that way you have a good long root system and it'll help shade out the you know soil underneath it and keep evaporation down. You know, still, you know, during that growing season when it does get warm, 
you know, watch that rainfall, make sure you're getting, you know, that close to that one inch of water per week. Uh, and occasionally, you know, you'll run into the, the area that in some areas that uh, the thatching may need to be done or even a, a, a core aeration, you know, followed by a top dressing, a sandy loam. Go ahead. So the main thing, you know, is how the St. Augustine is, you know, you got your runners that are up on top. Um, some of the grasses have rhizomes under underneath, you know, the whole thing that, you know, we impress upon is, you know, those leaves, you know, they can get all kinds of funguses and stuff like that. You know, we've got to be careful about how we manage our turf grasses. I think from a, a, a zero escape stand for, standpoint, but also just a environmental standpoint. Uh, there's a lot of turf grasses that, you know, can contribute to, you know, runoff and uh, cause problems because we over fertilize them or we're using too many weed and feeds. Uh, I know that I always kind of uh, was able to dictate when red tide blooms would happen in Corpus area just based on, you know, hey, it's going to rain this weekend. Everybody goes out and fertilizes and we end up getting a larger rain than necessary. So that water goes into the sewer system and out into the bays. And then you would have tidal, you know, red tide blooms and brown algae blooms and things like that. So you got to be careful with that. Go ahead. Um, you know, the whole thing, to healthy lawns, you know, proper watering, like I said, you know, you can eventually wean those grasses off as long as they're, you know, been well established, you know, over a few years you're, and you're providing what's necessary for them. Um, the whole thing is, is that, you know, uh, some people just have a feeling that they have to set that sprinkler system and, you know, kind of a set it and forget it type thing uh, when you really need to be monitoring that and, and, and only giving that turf grass water when it absolutely needs it. Uh, watering deeply is a challenge for some people, especially when you have uh, very heavy clay soils. Um, sometimes it requires you to do a cycle soaking uh, program where you water half the amount uh, and then come back an hour or two later and water the rest of it so it'll get further and deeper down into the soil column. Uh, that's one of the challenges that we used to have in Corpus, especially with you know heavy clay soil. And if you had a slope too on your lawn, you, you had to kind of uh, be uh, be creative with your watering schedule and sometimes water it, you know, maybe several times in a row, um, you know, keeping a couple hours in between. Um, you know, fertilization, I like to, you know, my biggest thing is keep, you know, have a soil test performed. Uh, a lot of people go out there and in fact, I just saw one of houses I drove by yesterday. I saw three bags of weed and feed in somebody's lawn, I mean, in somebody's garage. And I was thinking, wow, that bag treats 5,000 square feet and they're fixing to throw that out there. That's not going to be good. <clears throat> so, you know, just make sure you fertilize appropriately, you know, check that soil test every about two to three years. That way you know where you are and what kind of uh, things you put out there. And, you know, and watch for insects and diseases, you know, stay ahead of it. If you know you get large patch in an area every year at about a certain time, you know, using a fungicide ahead of time may be a good preventative method or you know try to do something else that it will alleviate some of the, the the things that contributed to it like too much moisture you know making sure you turn your sprinklers off earlier in the season or just eliminating or, or even putting in some type of uh, better drainage in an area go ahead so yeah testing your soil uh good you know keep keep track of your nutrient levels you know there's different nutrient levels from down in corpus all the way up here to montgomery uh, in the Conroe area, Houston. So, you know, pH plays a big part in that. Uh, a lot of times there, with higher pH soils, you have a, a lack of certain nutrients that are available to the plant. So they either have to be added separately or um, in addition to, uh, to uh, what's already available. Uh, you know, the whole thing is too, and if you're doing it right and you're, you're monitoring those things, you can really kind of save yourself a money, some money. Uh, like I said, you know, here's the guy yesterday with three bags of uh, weed and feed in his yard and I mean in his garage and, you know, I, I can't imagine what he spent per bag on that. So if he was actually doing a soil test, he would realize that one bag would probably spread up between two uh, two seasons. Um, so that's the whole thing. It, it'll it'll save you. Um, there are uh, I'm just looking at some questions here. Yeah, there are a lot of native grass seed mixes, uh, some that um, work well in certain areas, but not in others. So you have to be really careful. Um, there was a native plant seed mix that was recommended by one of the companies. Uh, we tried it in our area and it just didn't work. We have too humid a conditions here. 
Um, so just, you know, check with your local extension agent, you know, find out what kind of mixes might work. Um, I had a master gardener many years ago. Uh, she actually replaced her whole front lawn with some uh, native grass seeds and stuff like that. And it was quite neat. Um, a lot of people don't don't see it and don't like it, but uh, because it takes some getting used to, because the fact is, is that some of those native seeds or native plants that are like that are like curly mesquite and some of those tend to get a little taller. Uh, so it doesn't look as well manicured and some people don't like that. So um, what kind of fertilizer do you use if you fertilize monthly? Um, I asked the question, why are you fertilizing monthly? Because that that's technically not a um, that's not a good thing. Um, you, you should two to three times at most during the year. Uh, you don't want to fertilize every month because some of the times you will fertilize if the grass is stressed because of being dormant or because of heat stress. Uh, the biggest problem will be the fact that that uh, you'll stress the grass out even more and you'll, you're just going to cause more problems. So, you know, fertilizing twice a year when the grass is actively growing or actively begins growing is the best time to do that. Okay, go ahead. There's a soil test form, how to do a soil, proper soil test. And, and Kevin, if you want to jump in at any time, you let me know. I'm going to jump in on the next slide, okay? Uh, sounds good. All right. So typically, um, you know, typically didn't want to decide to say monthly. Uh, I don't remember that. Um, I know that recommendations typically are one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. So for you to do a monthly fertilization uh, with any kind of fertilizer, it would be um, you would put out so little fertilizer, it'd be almost hard to do. Uh, there are different ways to fertilize, maybe using our, you know, a compost or something like that. But you have to be careful as far as timing when you do that as well. Um, like I said, just, you know, talk to your uh, county extension agent in different areas, different parts of the state require different things. But typically just a routine analysis would work uh, for soil sample tests for your lawn. Uh, like I said, do it every two to three years. Uh, that way you are just kind of keeping up and, and knowing what kind of nutrients need to be put out there to make that grass absolutely healthy. Go ahead, Kevin, take it away. Okay, Michael, thank you so much. <clears throat> and I always tell people, let your grass dictate when it needs to be fertilized. You, um, one of the worst things that you can do is, is get out there and think that uh, more fertilizer is better. Uh, if you remember earlier, one of the slides earlier also said more is not always better. And um, so we need to be careful with that. And, yet, and yes, I made a mistake and, and should have fixed that on the other slide. So uh, please excuse me for doing that. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about pavers, ground covers and shrubs. So uh, pavers are a great idea in a xeriscape garden. They provide easy access through the garden. They also uh, provide visual interest. You can see that on the left picture here that we actually have a brick patio. This is actually in our Xeriscape garden here in Corpus Christi. And on this upper picture, they've just used simple pavers and made a simple path through the through the garden. Plus, keep in mind, uh, the more space you take up with plants and with pavers, the the less space there is, uh, the less turf that you're going to have and the, and the less maintenance issues you're going to have to trying to take care of that turf. In this bottom picture, they've actually got uh, it looks like uh, concrete and they've got a, um, a sitting area and you notice that they have limited turf there as well. You can even do an entire xeriscape with no turf at all. It's possible to, to have an area uh, that has just uh, walkways and then in this situation they've used rock uh, to provide the the uh, what would have normally been probably the turf area. So. And then water efficiently, it's going to be important to group your plants together uh, and put things together that have similar needs uh, so that you can be more efficient. Uh, you wouldn't want to put something uh, in that uh, a cactus in with something that requires more water because the two of those are not going to be uh, compatible with each other. And then choose an irrigation method that works best for uh, the plants in that area. Um, oftentimes a drip irrigation system works really well but it may be that you have to put up some sort of pop-up sprinklers or that you just hand water. 
uh, depend upon the types of plants. And uh, once the plants are established, uh, you can usually get by with an inch of water or less a week, and it's always better to uh, water it deeply so that that water gets down to the root system. Uh, we want those roots, especially here in in um, the Gulf Coast, we want those roots to be down deep because we know that we have sometimes miserable summers, and the deeper the root systems are on our plants, the more likely they are to survive these miserable summers. You know, I always tell people, when they ask me what plants should I buy, I tell them, well, get out in the in the hottest part of the summer and just uh, take a look around your neighborhood because whatever seems to be doing good in your neighborhood during the hottest part of the summer is probably uh, a good plant to go to the nursery and find. So rather than letting other people dictate what, what you buy, uh, use uh, your camera and just get out and walk or drive around and see what things are actually doing well whenever it's miserable here. And uh, it's recommended that you don't water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. because that's generally when you have the highest evaporation rates. Uh, we want to water early on in the morning. We also don't want to water at night because that puts water on the leaves or the foliage and it makes the likelihood that you're going to have fungal diseases more likely. Uh, you need to check your irrigation systems frequently. Um, also your equipment that you're using. Uh, it's a good idea to check them at least annually, if not a couple of times a year to make sure that everything is working properly. And then rain sensors are always a good investment. Most modern irrigation systems have got rain sensors on them now, uh, but uh, you have to at least uh, look at your forecast ahead of time and know if it says that it's going to rain, that you need to make sure that you've turned off the sprinkler system so that uh, it's not a problem. And then you should use mulch to reduce evaporation. Um, it's generally recommended that you apply two to four inches of mulch. Uh, you can use both organic mulches or inorganic mulches. There are lots of different choices and uh, make sure that you keep that mulch away from uh, the trunks. Keep in mind that mulches uh, are one of the intended uses of mulches is to uh, keep weeds down. So if you put that mulch up next to your trunks, you're basically um, telling that mulch, hey, this is a weed and it could cause problems for you. Mulch slows down water loss and it minimizes the amount of evaporation out of the soil. So it actually acts as a barrier to, to help keep that moisture in for you. Mulch increases percolation during rain or watering. Um, as mulch breaks down, it uh, decomposes and uh, introduces organic matter into the soil. So it's a great choice to, to add a, an organic mulch so that you can do that. Um, and then it limits weed growth. And in the summertime, it actually helps to keep the soil a little bit cooler. And mulch can increase beneficial biological activity in the soil. Um, and uh, I, I don't... Uh, like putting plastic sheeting under mulch. Uh, if you've ever tried to plant a plant and you dig in down there with the shovel and you run into that plastic, um, it can be a problem. I'd rather just put the mulch and, and pull whatever weeds come up. And uh, often your cities have got free mulch available. Um, you can get it at your landfills. Uh, one of the things that I hear about the free mulch is, well, sometimes it has trash and it. how do I know that it's chemical free? Um, cities do a pretty good job of try, trying to regulate this and and so just contact your city and ask them how they how they control what goes into the mulch. Here uh, again is a Xeriscape garden and you can see that uh, the mulch actually helps to make the landscape look much nicer. It also holds the soil in place and prevents erosion, uh, reduces the weeds and saves water. And water quality, uh, well water you should have it tested uh, probably at least every couple of years to make sure that that it's appropriate. Um, well water is a good thing, but if it is high pH, if, if it's alkaline, if it's full of salts, uh, you actually can cause some damage to your uh, landscape by using well water. So check it and make sure that it's suitable for irrigation before you uh, just start pumping it out and putting it everywhere. City water should only be used as a supplement to rainfall. Uh, just because you have an irrigation system doesn't mean that it has to run all the time. So water when it's appropriate. 
Uh, you know, what's crazy along the Gulf Coast is that the rainfall can vary all the way from um, 18 to 20 inches all the way up to 60 inches, just depending upon what part of the area you're in. But these zero escape principles still apply to all of the all those areas. And like we said, just choose plants that are appropriate for your area and, and you'll do great. Michael, would you like to talk about irrigation audits for just a second? Certainly. OK, with probably one of those important things you can do uh, is do an irrigation audit, especially when it comes to your turf and as well as your landscape plants uh, too. Uh, you want to make sure that you are putting out the right amount of water, putting it out at an appropriate manner um, and in, in the right place. You know, most of the time, you know, we're watering areas the, with spray heads. Sometimes they get clogged. They don't spray in the right direction. Doing an irrigation audit is very important so you make sure that they're doing what that's necessary. Otherwise, then you, you know, lose plants, which cost you money and things like that. So um, there's different types. Of course, you know, you got your, your above ground or your pop-up types. Uh, you have subsurface irrigation that's down below the ground. Um, not really used a whole lot, uh, but it is used in some areas. Um, and then, you, of course, you have your drip irrigation. And probably drip irrigation is one of the most efficient. Um, you know, I saw the question earlier about somebody saying, you know, how can we get mul uh, water past the mulch? Um, I, th I think back to years ago where we did a study out in one of the uh, big crop fields, and they were basically simulated an inch an hour rain, and they had an area that had been stripped of all the debris and it was just bare ground and they had an area that we actually threw um, pieces of you know stalks and wood and things in and they simulated this inch an hour rainfall and believe it or not that all that compost basically or or mulch that was there on top helped that water penetrate the ground on the other side where you know it's a heavy clay soil both sides heavy clay soils uh, the other side just puddled up uh, so, you know, having good mulch and everything in your landscapes is, is a great way to help that water penetrate and get deeper into the soil. Um, you know, if you combine that with using a, a drip irrigation, it's, it, it'll be great as well. Go ahead. So, you know, get to know your system. That's probably one of the things I always tell people, you know, f first off, know where that controller is, get the manual. You know, nowadays we can download those manuals off uh, online, learn how to operate it appropriately. Um, and when you do an irrigation audit, you're not only looking for leaks, you're looking for spray patterns. You're also going to, once you get all that kind of figured out, uh, you're going to get to the point where you're going to find out that you need some, you know, uh, little catch cups or open containers um, that you need to, you know, basically catch the water for a period of time. Uh, and if you go back and once you get, the, I did a class on irrigation audits uh, that was regarding on the Gulf Coast. You can go back and even watch that one. It talks in more depth about how to do that. But just getting to know the, that system, knowing where the off button is sometimes is the best thing you could do. Go ahead. And, and to kind of reiterate what uh, Joanne said earlier, you know, rainwater harvesting is a great way uh, to help reduce that that use of that water through the pipe. OK. You can see how much you could potentially save or even catch a year, just depending on uh, what kind of roof material and and uh, how large that roof is. All right. Go ahead. Take it away. All right. So uh, it's going to be important to, to learn what type of maintenance your property needs and so that you can have good horticultural practices. Not every landscape is going to require the same maintenance. So, um, you know, that's part of the planning process when you're planning out your use areas to, to figure out what type of maintenance is going to need. Um, mow the lawns frequently, but at a high level. Fertilize as needed, but not excessively. Organic fertilizers actually break down slower, and, and so you may want to choose to use those. There are actually some, some uh, good reasons to use organic fertilizers. You have less chance of actually burning your lawn. Get rid of any weeds uh, because weeds are um, use a lot of water. So the quicker you can get rid of the weeds, the better off you are. And maintain your irrigation systems and then prune as needed. Here's actually a photo of our Xeriscape garden here in Corpus Christi before the freeze. It doesn't look quite that good now, but uh, 
It, it's a nice location. If you're ever in Corpus Christi and you uh, want to see it, it's uh, located downtown 1900 Chaparral Street next to the Museum of Science and History. So there are always things that you can't control, and we know that along the Gulf Coast, one of the things that you can't control is the weather. Uh, the, this is a picture of our Xeriscape Garden after Hurricane Harvey. We came in and, and uh, Hurricane Harvey actually helped us remove some trees that, that were probably uh, in the process of, of needing to be removed anyway. So uh, Hurricane Harvey just kind of sped things up. Um, so the other things you can't control is animals. Animals kind of do whatever they want to, especially if they're wild animals. So keep that in mind. And then people, uh, we uh, frequently have uh, unwanted visitors to our Xeriscape Garden. Most people stroll through just to, to see what's going on and, and see what plants are doing well. Uh, at nighttime, we have some people that choose to, to sleep there and, and to uh, throw their trash and stuff out. So just keep in mind that there's some things you can't control. Here's another picture after Hurricane Harvey. I'm going to let Joanne talk about uh, this slide, if Joanne's still on. Thanks, Kevin. Um, uh, anyone that's interested in keeping track of where we are as far as the drought impact on uh, Texas surface water, you can go to the Texas, um, well, TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, uh, go to a water tab, and then uh, to your far right on that page, you'll see uh, drought conditions. And so this is just um, the most recent map that was put up and it kind of shows you what's going on throughout the state. So we're not the only ones that are experiencing drought conditions. And uh, so this is a resource that you can check on from time to time. And also I recommend that, you know, the, uh, the TCEQ website is um, a great uh, resource for, um, you know, helpful hints, um, you know, things that you can do um, to help minimize your water use. So, um, you know, please make sure that you, whenever you're just browsing around next time, uh, check that out. There you go, Kevin. All right. Um, we're just about out of time and we have some uh, examples of plants that are found that are appropriate for Xeriscape and I'm going to skip this slide and move on so that we can uh, point those out and Joanne's going to help me with this. So here we have American Beautyberry. That's a bicolor iris. We have Bottle Brush. Sinisa Texas Sage. Crepe Myrtle. Uh, Joanne was talking about the bark and how it adds interest earlier. Desert Willow uh, does very well in along the Gulf Coast. And we have Firecracker Bush. Hamalia, um, great for birds and bees, butterflies. Fox, foxtail Fern. You've got your muley grass, which again will add uh, interest in color and you know movement in your garden. That's a flax lily. Uh, Indian hawthorn. All right. There we have your native uh, Mexican um, plant, olive. Uh, olive. Ritama. Soap berry. Here we have uh, rock rose. Yopon, holly. And then we have Texas mountain laurel. By the way, our Texas mountain laurels made it through the freeze very easily. I hope that was the case all the way across the state. Um, it, they were actually blooming just a, a week or a week and a half after the freeze. So, And that concludes our presentation for today. We, we want to thank all of y'all for joining us. Um, and again, you will be getting a uh, things in the email, so watch your email. Make sure that if you could possibly fill out the survey and return them to us. I want to thank Joanne, uh, Salji, and Michael Potter for um, for making this 
presentation possible today and uh, for all of your help. So uh, we thank you all for joining us and, and we appreciate you so much.